we're delighted with the turnout. Thanks very much for, for, for coming along. I thought with Euro 2016 on, with Coldplay at Wembley, and maybe even some people out canvassing for the referendum one way or the other, um, there'll be nobody here, but it's delighted, we're delighted to see you. So thanks to the RSS for publishing our paper, uh, to Mike and his colleagues in the official statistics section for sponsoring and organizing this, this ordinary meeting, which gives, gives us the opportunity to kind of present our paper, and most importantly of all, for the paper to be discussed, because that for us is, is the vital part of this evening. Uh, we also hope that the discussion will continue uh, on in as many ways as possible from here on. Uh, and a kind of spoiler alert, uh, we actually don't have all the answers. We kind of want to kind of stimulate, uh, stimulate discussion. <coughs> so we thought there's probably kind of four key messages that we wanted to kind of play out through the paper and through the presentation this evening. There's got themes running through our paper and our presentation. Uh, first one, it's not just about devising new measures of national well-being and progress, but actually understanding why these measures are needed uh, and how they will be used. Um, as, uh, as Mayor has put it, measurement does not in itself automatically translate into policy. So you can measure something, but it doesn't necessarily mean uh, anything's going to change. The second theme, very we briefly touch on, is actually it's worth reflecting on history, that some of the ideas, many of the ideas in our paper are not, not new. They've been around for quite some time. Uh, the third theme, um, this is actually about kind of working progress really we're reporting on um, uh, statistical developments which are still developments there are kind of challenges still to be faced uh, in bringing these measures into use use both methodological statistical measurement questions David would be talking uh, in particular about kind of the measurement thinking of this as a measurement as a measurement issue uh, but also about providing policymakers with appropriate tools uh, and, and, and the data and the kind of continuing challenge of kind of setting these new figures, these new statistics uh, against uh, uh, the dominance of the economic statistical picture. Um, so there are also then challenges of assessing the sustainability and the state of the environment, um, all difficult, difficult to measure. And our fourth theme um, is that we, uh, for reasons that will become apparent, are gr great fans of the Measuring National Wellbeing Programme, as it was, of the, of the ONS. We think that this is an exemplar. It's kind of helping to shape the agenda, um, but also learning from developments elsewhere. There are challenges around international comparability, um, including understanding why that is, that is important. So I should, of course, at this stage say that we couldn't have written this paper without all the work that's been done and published by the ONS's Measuring National Wellbeing Programme. It was a great privilege for me to have led the programme up to 2012 um, and to have worked with David and the other members of the programme's technical advisory group. The usual disclaimer, of course, applies that the views expressed from here on are not necessarily um, those of them, but they are purely the views of David and myself. So this is all about an apparently simple question how's the country doing? And I'm trying to answer that not just in terms of economic performance and material well-being, but also in terms of individual well-being, social progress, quality of life, state of the environment, and the sustainability of all this. We see an increasing demand for statistical measures that broaden and enrich the established facts of economic life. Um, there is an appetite for knowing about social progress, about social differences, and about the natural environment and natural resources <coughs> and we might on, on which we rely and we might add that that's even uh, among economists as for example the recent B review uh, confirmed because this is sometimes characteris characterized as kind of GDP and beyond so here's UK GP GDP uh, and one other measure average life satisfaction for the UK from the, from, uh, as measured by Eurobarometer going back over uh, many years. So the figures show what's ha been happening since 1973 to 2013. We took this chart from the Common Office's website, um, and you may all rec or may recognize this as illustrating what's been known for some time as the, the Easterlin paradox, that despite getting wealthier, in other words, GDP per capita of the country, uh, increasing steadily over that time, apart from the recession of the last the last few years, um, 
GDP in aggregate or, or, or on average, uh, citizens on average are not reporting that they are getting any more satisfied with their lives. That's the, the bottom line in that chart, which is very much, we think, rolling around a, a fairly level position. There's been much debate about this over the, uh, over the years, um, including uh, on the measures used. Um, life satisfaction is a bounded scale, um, uh, as opposed to GDP is an unbounded scale. Um, what the Cabinet Office uh, drew from this, um, and what's at the heart of our paper, uh, is, is the need to develop additional measures of progress beyond, beyond GDP to complement the traditional ones used, GDP in particular, the one that's most often in news reports, in political manifestos, and which underpin, underpins many business and personal decisions. Well, why now? We see this as part of transforming our world, uh, and the quote here is from the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Um, the we is every nation in the world has signed up to committed to developing broader measures of progress to complement GDP. Uh, the sustainable development goals, which are also set out in the United Nations Agenda, uh, are described by some as the only game in town, not just our town, but every country around the world. Um, and there'll be more on this next week uh, when Andrew Tatum gives the beverage lecture on mapping progress towards the sustainable development goals. He'll be talking about the need for consistent, comparable, and regularly updated metrics and the challenges, especially meeting that in middle and low income countries. Our point is that the United Nations agenda contains this universal commitment to develop broader measures. Um, the strongest possible signal yet that new measures uh, are to be used. Uh, even if a government says that it will meet the sustainable development goals purely by focusing uh, on, on economic growth, uh, then we still see that these wider measures would be needed to hold that government to account. In the paper, we draw attention to a contrast which came out a lot in our dialogue with the referees of the paper. It's a contrast between national well-being, a phrase used by the ONS to assess the broad progress of the country, and individual, personal, or subjective well-being, which is when any of us assesses how our life is, is, is going. Of course, these are strongly interrelated. There are some who see national well-being as no more than simply the sum of individual well-being, and others, including us, um, who see well-being as at the heart of national well-being, individual well-being at the heart of national well-being, uh, but not sufficient, uh, necessary, but not sufficient to understand and assess national well-being and progress. Now, of course, there's been, there has actually been huge work, amount of work over, over, over decades, indeed over centuries, to measure social progress beyond looking at the, the economics. Sir John K Sinclair is our champion for promoting the need for data and for evidence-informed policy making, and he was doing it in the 1790s. Um, his, uh, to compile his statistical account of Scotland, uh, he asked 163 questions to church ministers, um, of which three are on the screen now, um, uh, and you'll see each three is, uh, is, are, are pretty complex. Um, I think perhaps what we now know about kind of asking survey questions, we wouldn't uh, ask questions like, uh, like this in, in, in one gallop. Um, more work was obviously needed on the questions, maybe asking people themselves rather than their, their church minister. Um, and Sir John wasn't kind of great on statistical presentation, but the effort in collecting this data and writing it all up um, was uh, really a very early shining example of the need to kind of look more broadly at what you mean by the, the well-being and progress of, 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 of a country. Um, but to come to the more modern age, I'm sure most of you uh, if not all of you know Robert Kennedy's campaigning speech in 1968, here's a flavour of it, just to remind you of some of the uh, fantastic language he used around um, you know, the, the difficulties with uh, gross national product. Uh, in short, measuring everything except that which makes life worthwhile. This was a kind of challenge for, for statisticians in terms of looking at things that he did talk about. How on earth do you measure the quality of education or the intelligence of public debate? Uh, but, it, but, st but um, statisticians and, 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 and others rose to that challenge with, with, with the emergence of the, the social indicator movement. Okay. Um, we talk in the paper about kind of whether the, 
the social indicator movement failed, and we've come to the conclusion, along with, with, with following Batch and Ridd, and that, yes, we agree with that, that um, they've judged that the social indicator movement, by its lack of impact on, on politics of, 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 of the day. Of course, there was a huge proliferation of social indicators, on the one hand, with the legacy of indicators, um, uh, which we can draw on. However, there was always, always a tendency to kind of reinvent new, uh, new indicators and to start uh, to start from uh, and to start from scratch. So when you people talk about social metrics or social sustainability, essentially this measuring the same kind of things, they've invented new indicators rather than drilling back into into that. And really, none of these indicators managed to challenge um, the, the the dominance of, of, of GDP. So in the paper, we kind of talk about what led to the measuring national wellbeing program and the kind of second wave of interest in in going beyond GDP, um, uh, the, the Stiglitz Sen for Tutsi Commission, the Commission on the Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress. Um, we talk about the well-being measurement being uh, being contested. Um, giving a quote from the Institute for Economic Affairs, for example. Um, uh, but but what happened is that kind of the coalition government gave a commitment to develop broader measures. Uh, to develop broader indicators of well-being and, and sustainability. Uh, and there are examples where these measures have been embedded in legislation, up on the screen there, public services, social value act, and in Wales, the well-being of, of, of future generations. <coughs> Many of you will be aware of the uh, key features of the ONS's Measuring National Wellbeing Programme, launched in 2010 by the, by the Prime Minister, which led the media to characterise this as Mr. Cameron's happiness index, uh, wrong on all three counts. Um, it wasn't Mr. Cameron's index, it wasn't just about happiness, and actually it wasn't an, an index. There are currently some 40 odd indicators in there, but you know the media likes a good, uh, a good story. The aims, aim of the program was to provide broadly accepted and trusted measures, plural, of well-being, um, to, to supplement existing economic, social, and environmental measures. It's effectively the UK's implementation of the Stiglitz Centre for Tutsi recommendations, um, uh, and the f there is a framework to it, um, which we show in the paper. Uh, unlike the OECD, the, uh, in assessing UK national well-being uh, means looking both at current and at future well-being concurrently. There's a lot of innovation in the programme, which we uh, talk about in the paper. Um, the What Matters exercise, a huge qualitative exercise to determine of what shape national well-being should look like and, and, and what it should measure. The introduction of the, the personal measures in official surveys, close working with policy makers. ONS was one of the first uh, national statistics offices to include subjective well measures, subjective well-being measures uh, in its regular surveys, for example. Um, the framework for measuring national well-being we include in, in the paper, the way to read this diagram is since to start at the centre, to start at individual well-being, uh, to look at the, um, because that's, you know, that's, that's where the, this is the heart of national well-being, is kind of individual well-being, um, um, but to look around at the, uh, the things that matter to people, um, it's probably better in the paper than actually on the screen, apologies for that, but things like health um, and uh, uh, relationships, um, uh, education and skills, for example, and then the broader context of the economy, uh, environment and, 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 and governance. Um, uh, again, measuring these things to bring out equality and fairness, so how these things are distributed over people and the sustainability over time. Uh, and ONS currently have 43, I think it is, measures which kind of sit on their website uh, uh, to present this in, in practice. Um, in March 2016, seven, more in, seven of those weren't available to compare over a three-year period. Um, 17 showed an improvement, 11 showed little or no overall change, and eight actually showed a decline over the three year period. So you'll see that kind of measuring national well-being is actually quite a complex picture emerges rather than a, a single number at this stage. Um, in the paper we summarize how ONS selected uh, the four subjective well-being questions. Um, I won't spend uh, time on them now. They come from different backgrounds, different areas, um, different areas of, 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 of interest. Um, uh, uh, evaluative, uh, e e e dynamic, uh, and affect positive and negative 
hashtag. These are drawn from work that has been done elsewhere, taken into ONS, tested in the context of a large social survey. Um, and ONS's strategy basically was to ask four questions only of a large number of people. Um, but of course, if you're drilling down into understanding uh, well-being, you need to ask rather more questions than that, as indeed ONS does uh, in smaller, smaller surveys. But in the paper, we set out why uh, on balance, this seems to be a good idea to go for kind of four, four sort of headline questions and use these questions in a variety of different 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 places. Are people using the measuring national well-being data to make a make a difference? Well, in a ma the way they are, um, they're focusing particularly on the subjective well-being data, and that's that, that's new, um, and that's good. New analyses are coming along by New Economics Foundation, for example, as well as, as well as ONS. We talk about how the HM Treasury Green Book um, uh, guidance on cost benefit has been updated to recognise subjective well-being data can be used in assessing costs and benefits of policy options. Um, ONS's um, uh, well-being data has been used in other social research and policy research acro across government. Um, there is a what, what I don't think we mentioned in the paper, but it, we should do. There was a kind of what what work centre for well-being um, joining a, a number of other. What work centres kind of taking the ideas out to, to policymakers, um, but it still leaves the kind of question about how to shift attention uh, to the full set of wider measures beyond uh, the, the subjective well measures. So before answering that, I'm going to kind of hand over to David to talk about particularly about section six in our paper, because don't forget that there is still a number of measurement issues before we get to the the end of this story. Thank you. So. Uh in the abstract of the paper, we say we explore some of the challenges which need to be faced to bring wider measures of national well-being into use. And, and that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about some of the statistical, some of the statistical challenges. I'm going to briefly talk about the measurement properties. I have particular interest in, in how we measure things. So I'm going to talk a bit about measurement properties and how scales are constructed. And then I'm going to hop up a level and sort of once you've got the data, as it were, issues of analysis which occur in this particular context, which of course intersect with similar issues in, in other related contexts. It's not, they're not unique to the measurement of well-being, although that may be particularly pointed here. And then I'm going to return to this uh, issue of sing whether, whether we should be talking about a single overall measure of well-being or, or a profile of different measures. So I'm going to try to cover all those topics, not necessarily in that order. So, well-being is what's called a pragmatic measurement. It's not like measuring weight or length or height or something like that, electrical charge, where you define a mapping from an empirical system in the real world to a numerical system, which, where the numbers, relationships between the numbers represent the relationships between objects in terms of the attribute you're measuring. It's clearly something very different from that. And what you actually do when you're in this sort of context, in pragmatic measurement, is you simultaneously define what it is you want to measure and describe how you're going to measure it. So the definition of what, what you are measuring, the concept you're measuring, is implicit in the way you construct the measurement procedure. It's closely related to um, the philosophical sort of approach of uh, Bridgman. He, he was a Nobel laureate physicist. Um, he came up with this thing called operationalism, which is defined like that, the concepts synonymous with the corresponding set of operations. In physics, it's sort of gone out of fashion, but it's very pertinent and describes exactly what's happened, what, what, what we do in, in the context of measuring well-being, but many other things. GDP is another example. Inflation is another example. The sorts of things we do in this sort of context, pragmatic measurement, simultaneously defining the thing uh, and describing how to measure it. They are two sides of the same coin. One of the consequences of this is that different people with different objectives trying to do different things should be expected to have different definitions, come up with different measures. They should be, they should be expected to regard different aspects as important and want to stick those different aspects together in different ways to reflect what they are really trying to do, what they think of uh, well-being in this particular context is. Um, so there is no best measure of well-being just there as there is no best measure of inflation. Different measures are appropriate for different kinds of uses. And, and what's particularly important is that you should choose the right measure for the question you're trying to answer for your particular purpose. And I've got a, a little example here, a, a very straightforward example 
of exactly this sort of thing. Some of you will be familiar with this. If you've got a psychological background, you're fam or perhaps a medical background familiar with it. The APGAR scale of the health of a newborn baby. APGAR isn't an acronym. It's the surname of Virginia APGAR, who in the 1950s came up with this scheme. She looked at a whole load of different indicators of the health of a newborn baby. She chose five, which were, you could easily measure them. You didn't need instruments to measure them. You could just look at the baby and determine what they were. She graded them. She said, I'm going to grade each of them, not one or two, two being the most severe, and then I'm just going to add them up. So that was her definition of what well-being was for a newborn baby. But it's simultaneously telling you how to measure it. And it's very, very useful. It's used all over the place, very widely used. But it's a pragmatic measurement, very different from measuring weight or, or height or anything. I should contrast that sort of strategy where you simultaneously define the thing and say how you're going to measure it with something like factor analysis, where in some sense this starts at the other end. You say that I'm trying to get at this core concept. I can't measure it, but I know it's related to these other things. You think of intelligence or something like that. It's difficult to get at, but you know it's related to ability on numerical tests, verbal reasoning tests, whatever. And, and from that, you can measure those things and then you can invert the relationship to get at the, um, the common aspect. So that's very different from what we're doing here, where you say, well, I think these things are relevant and I'm going to combine them in this way. So that's what we're doing in the context of how we measure well-being. Now, when you construct the scale, um, you clearly want it to have a, a number of properties. Clearly, you want it to span, think, think of the APGAR scale, you want it to span the space that you're interested in. You don't want to leave out major aspects that ought to be covered. So make sure it spans the space, make sure it captures the concept of interest. It should be sensitive, and this is how you can tell whether a measure is good or not, it should be sensitive to differences which matter. Uh, a measure which always produced the same value would not be much use for uh, telling whether policy um, was working policy interventions worked or comparing different groups in society or something. But it mustn't be wildly erratic. It mustn't fluctuate dramatically, have a high volatility, fluctuate dramatically over time. Um, so there are all sorts of uh, pragmatic considerations which must be brought to bear when you're constructing a scale like this. Um, I mentioned, and indeed Paul mentioned as well, the question of whether you should have a profile rather than a single score. Paul mentioned the fact that the ONS have over 40 aspects of this touching on different parts. And of course, that's very important by looking at all of these 40 different aspects. You can get a very good sensitive measure of you know, how different parts of society are behaving, if you like. And um, important aspects include things like individual well-being, which is a particularly important part and the part which has perhaps been most investigated. I'll say a little bit about that in a moment. But other things like the economy, the natural environment, sustainability, and so on. A measure which didn't take into account, for instance, the uh, consumption of finite resources. You might think, this is wonderful, we're doing very well, but just round the corner, you know, things are going to collapse. One would want somehow to take that into account. So it's good to have a profile. It can be very sensitive. You can look at different aspects. Uh, um, very useful. But GDP does so well despite being only measuring one aspect of well-being, does so well because it's a single number. And the fact is, if one just produced all of the 40 numbers and put them out there, you can guarantee that the Daily Mail or the media, journalists, whatever, would summarise those into a single measure so that one could say, with a simple numerical score, whether things were uh, getting better or worse. So there are also merits in a single score. But then, of course, better that we should produce a single score than that we should leave it to journalists because we can decide how they should be weighted, decide how they should be combined all together we can, and make sure that they've got uh, attractive and appropriate good statistical properties such as the ones that I've listed at the top. Um, I hope it's very clear from what I've said that it's very easy to come up with a measure of well-being or whatever, think of um, personal, subjective, individual well-being but it's very difficult to come up with measures which have got attractive and appropriate statistical properties. And I love this quote because it conveys 
uh, the amount of effort. And if you if you think about the amount of effort that the ONS putting it put into developing, for example, just their four subjective individual well-being questions that Paul mentioned, they tried lots of different questions with different endings and so on, lots of different groups of people, lots of different surveys and so on to come up with those. They didn't just sit down and say, oh, let's come up with four questions which which measure uh, in individual well-being. It takes time to develop if if they're going to be good. I missed that. How many minutes? Thank you. <laughs> Does that include Paul after me as well? Or? <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, there are all sorts of statistical difficulties. Um, most attention has been on measuring subjective well-being, um, but there are perhaps tougher statistical challenges of the other components. And some of the statistical challenges, again, are, are not unique to this area, but certainly crop up in, in this sort of area. Um, perhaps I could just mention two of them, the last two, although the others are just as important. The homeostatic effect. This, is, this describes the phenomenon that people have a natural, web, a natural level of well-being. So, for instance, it's observed that if you win the lottery, uh, if you win a jackpot on the lottery, for a little while people are euphoric, but then they revert. And quite clearly, if you're measuring, hoping to measure the impact of policy changes, this sort of phenomenon is going to complicate things. And, and regression to the mean, of course, is ubiquitous and often sneaks in in unexpected ways. Uh, I have a lovely example of this from, which I, I'm not going to have time to put up here. One minute, I think. Um, I'm not going to have time to put up here, but uh, it compared, it was a comparison of um, how well being a change between 2007 and 2011 across the different EU countries. And when it was plotted, you saw that the ones which initially did badly over the four years had suddenly got much better, and the ones which initially did very well over the four years had suddenly got much worse. Clearly, regression to the mean. Um, I would just like to observe that things are complicated by the fact that populations change over time. These are, are, are not um, uh, in a static context. Um, and there are other things. Paul referred to the fact that well-being is on a bounded scale, but income, for instance, might not be. I said difficulty of teasing out causality there. So I just want to finish what I'm saying um, with, with this slide. Um, just to convey, I said I was going to say something about the difficulty of statistical analysis. First one will be familiar to all of you, I think. The media will report GDP has gone down half a percent or up, up half a percent out of the concept, context of a trend. And you all know it's probably just fluctuation, statistical fluctuation. The importance of statistical versus substantive significance. And then of communicating uncertainty. An important, and, and not just sampling variation, but um, uh, other sorts of uncertainty. I've got a quote there from um, the ONS Measuring National Wellbeing and Personal Wellbeing in the UK document. And you won't be able to read this, but the, li the first line, for instance, says, life satisfaction was 7.6 points out of 10, up 0.1 points. And the other lines below that have similar, up 0.08 points. And the trend line is shown over a year on, on the left. So it looks like it's improving, but I would like to, and, and highly significant, because of the large samples. But I would like to indicate the fact that this is in the context of other changes, like in particular populations changing, by reminding you that between 2011 and 2014, the proportion of the population aged over 65 went up more than 1%. And you'll probably be familiar with the sort of life satisfaction relationship between age. Older people generally are more satisfied than people in the intermediate ranges. So these small changes could be due, you know, it depends what you mean by um, well-being of, of, of the nation. We have somebody keeping us very strictly to time, but I just need to kind of take, take a few more minutes to just kind of draw some of these strands together and, and really kind of pull out kind of the key issues that we want to kind of present in, in the paper, really, which is, in a sense, the title of this slide. It, it sounds to, to us, that maybe we're biased, that this is a great idea, you know, but, but what's the use of all this? What are, what are we going to do? In 2010, the, the, uh, uh, the UK Prime Minister Tarsio and Esther is finding new ways of measuring well-being, but that didn't kind of commit anybody to actually doing anything or using those, those, those measures. It's a policy for, for, for measurement. Um, measures are clearly necessary, 
as a first step to be used as a performance criterion, but, but they, they, they've got to be used. And in the paper, we kind of think about some kind of potential uses of the measures, recognizing that it is, it, it, it is early days. Um, we note how the personal well-being outputs are being used in policy because the UK Statistics Authority has assessed them uh, and uh, looked, at, uh, looked, looked at this. Um, but we, you know, we ask the question, what if the full set of measuring national well-being measures were to be used instead of, uh, instead of GDP? And we quote in the paper how the UK Statistics Authority also did an assessment of the GDP figures and how they're used. I'm going to invite you to read that, 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 that quote, but using ma measuring national well-being in place, in, place in place of GDP. We cannot say yet that it's, um, we cannot yet say how the measures uh, are being used, uh, but we suggest that they do have the potential to be used in a variety of, in a variety of different ways. Now, some of this we think comes down to challenging GDP, and we ask the question, is it the role of ONS as the producer of national well-being measures to encourage their greater use? The role of national statistics is, is often to collect user requirements, um, but where those user requirements are, are new and emerging, and this is a, a topic which uh, is around a new set of statistics, um, then maybe some kind of outreach or marketing role is, ne is needed to, 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 ad to address that. Um, the role of intermediaries like the Degartum Institute uh, is very important, I think, to kind of raise the profile and raise, raise, raise the measure. Um, we touch in the paper on various infrastructure projects like new airports and uh, high-speed rail links, uh, and if those are going to be valued against the so-called triple bottom line of the economy, the environment, and, and, and social, social progress, that takes us very much into the territory of looking how national well-being would be applied uh, in, the, in, in, in those specific cases. We think are, are looking also for different political narratives. So far, only the Green Party has signed up to wider measures in its, uh, in its general election manifesto, talking about abandoning uh, GDP in the pursuit of growth as a measure of economic success. Um, so you know, we ask in the paper, in a sense, how green, though, is our country beyond uh, a Green Party? <coughs> Uh, we have a section in our paper on sense, national measures of, of, of national well-being um, and how that plays out against kind of international developments because we see this as another way uh, of exploring uh, the needs for, 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 for new measures. Um, this is also an issue in the development of the Sustainable Development Goals um, and, and, and the indicators. Um, uh, to mention, uh, again, Andrew Tatum's forthcoming beverage lecture, uh, he will be talking about the need for consistent, comparable, and regularly updated metrics. Um, uh, and I think we uh, understand that, um, but I think we raise the question about if we're measuring national well-being, then national approaches to meet national needs, what matters to the citizens of the country, as well as to supporting international comparisons and to learn where these are necessary and to produce international aggregates where, the, where these are necessary. But we do note that this could then give rise to the possibility of having several views of the well-being of a nation if there are different needs and different, different uses. So our concluding remarks, and this is not a conclusion, it's more a kind of a, a topics for, for discussion. Um, we're looking for a kind of a policy, sh we, we can see a policy shift to measuring well-being uh, and probably a stronger commitment than back in the times of uh, the social indicator movements, but the wider implications uh, of having these new, new measures, it seems to us, are taking time, time to appear. Building blocks are now in place to support well-being in policy, uh, but more action is required by those who support and sponsor policy inside government. Similarly, on the international scene, we wonder about well-being measurement developing more than well-being policy. So do we actually wait for statistical issues to be solved before we go into all of this? David set out some of the kind of measurement challenges uh, and, the, and the concern about measurement, um, you know, but GDP itself is still, uh, is, st is, still, is still evolving, so it's not clearly a matter of waiting for the actual definitive set of estimates. Can political advances be made uh, to look beyond GDP using the available measures uh, now? Uh, and one of our unresolved issues, which you notice that we haven't actually uh, answered in this, uh, in this presentation, is do we need a new single number for, for national well-being? I think that's a, a fascinating question. So we conclude our paper not with a conclusion but with a challenge really. Um, 
that the ONS continues to publish GDP and other economic measures, as well as now developing and publishing wider measures of national well-being and, and progress. Uh, we may be starting to acquire better measures, but are we still thinking mainly in terms of economic conditions and benefits, whether in politics, polit policy, or, or, or in everyday life? Economic growth alone does seem to be seen increasingly as a narrow ideal. Um, but so what more is needed to change how we can understand how the country is doing um, beyond, beyond economic performance? People are talking about seeking a fair balance, for example, balancing the needs of a business, its workforce, the economy, and society as l at large. Um, um, but uh, talking about these things is, uh, is one thing. Uh, do we really know what progress we are making as a country and what sort of world we're hanging on to, handing on to, to future generations? Thank you. I'm, I'm delighted to be able to respond and, and kick off the discussion on this paper, which I think is a really timely opportunity to, to look both backwards and forwards at well-being uh, and to see um, both where we've come from uh, and where we might go. So I think this is great. Um, I thought I'd start with the history because I, um, I, like I like to know where we've come from. So um, Sinclair started it all off and he chose this incredibly apt phrase, quantum of happiness, which has got all these wonderful connotations that, are, that weren't there when he set it out in the first place. So it might be something to do with quantum physics that you can't actually measure all these things, but I rather think of it in terms of Terry Pratchett. Uh, everything that was arcane was quantum in Terry Pratchett and this just came from magic from nowhere. Um, so I think what we're trying to measure in well-being is something that's really tricky. Um, and I think David explained part of the statistical reasons why that might be so. Um, I also wanted in passing just to mention that because Sinclair wrote out to these um, ministers and asked them things, he gave them um, an opportunity to say the things that were important to them. And because some of them were naturalists, they told you what beetles occurred in their parish. And that's still today an, in, an interesting set of original records for where beetles come from. Um, which is perhaps part of environmental well-being. So I think he was already starting the data collection at a very early time. Um, it's interesting to me that this was an, an international initiative in the first place, but not a prescriptive one, um, because nearly everything that comes down internationally says you will do it this way by this classification using this methodology. And this time it seems um, we've got an initi initiative, but not a clear way of doing it. And everybody's been set off to do their own thing and it's a little bit sort of evolution and survival of the fittest, and we'll see what comes out. Um, and I, I nicked one or two of the quotes from uh, the original um, David and Paul's paper, and I particularly like this one. Changing the way that economic performance was measured was a necessary precursor to changing behavior, which all seems that this is Sarkozy. Um, and I'm not sure whether you quoted him or paraphrased him, but one or the other. Uh, and it seems odd that if we were going wider, it's still economic performance that seems to be in here and counts. Uh, and that suggests to me something that is GDP and beyond. So economic performance is still very much of what's, what's going in here. And uh, in the paper, uh, Paul and David argued that there should be an overall index, but it, it should be of well-being, including GDP. Although I did notice in the slides uh, the sneaky little bit that said compete with GDP. So I, I'm, one of my little questions is what happens really with this single index, which I'm a, a fan of. Um, I, I think we should have one in order to compete with GDP, but should it include GDP or not? Because it's this international thing that's dribbled down um, with uh, no clear uh, international standard yet, uh, there's been big freedom to do wide consultation, and ONS have taken that very seriously and, and uh, really put a lot of effort into consulting with people and getting a set of measures. So we now have this magical set of 40 plus indicators, some of which previously existed, some of which are new, like the subjective well-being one. Um, and eventually there is going to be a need for some international standards uh, which possibly come with the uh, uh, United Nations um, indicators. Um, but um, I don't see any particular problem with that. It'll just be like um, consumer price indices again where there's a European harmonized standard and um, everybody else is allowed to do their own thing as well. So it would be just like that. Um, subjective well-being is a really tough thing to measure. Um, 
my well-being has fluctuated quite wildly over the last five minutes or so as the end of the presentation comes along and then I have to stand up here and talk to you and by the time it's all over I'm sure I shall feel fantastic. <laughs> Um, so self-assessment is quite tricky because you have all these um, um, telescoping effects and uh, when you ask somebody it might be something uh, quite uh, imminent has, has had an effect. So uh, like I say, if you ask me you get the same thing uh, over minutes previously. So I'm asking for some time averaging going on. Now, I think ONS have chosen this, uh, this um, single day but over a large number of people which is a good way to average those pieces pick up the point about absolute and relative scales because uh, GDP is unbounded uh, and we have this uh, homeostatic mechanism which pulls well-being back uh, and in order to really compete um, with GDP on the policy relevance uh, points I think we need something that can go up um, so I, I would really like some way of turning uh, subjective well-being as we now have it into a scale that isn't bounded I don't know how to do that, but it's just one suggestion on my slide is whether there's something you can do with hedonics to say how that relates to what happens in progress in other places. So whether you can do that in some way, um, because I think then it becomes much easier to target as a policy. Um, we have the population average stuff about uh, how to measure national well-being rather than aggregate personal well-being. And it's all quantum, isn't it? Um, so given that we have these measures now, uh, the real target and the, the real benefit in being able to discuss this paper now is uh, what can we do to make it different? Uh, and it says in the paper we want behaviour change uh, as a result of uh, having these measures. Now I think because uh, we've been in this situation of defining what the measures are and producing them, I think now the behaviour changes are to some extent at least conditioned on the measures. So uh, this is a very odd place where statistics is leading. So because we have a measure, now people will say, I'll set my policy to because this is something that you can measure and use. Um, and that uh, set of measures came from this wide-ranging consultation which captured what was important to people. But I'm not sure it asked what was important to policy. Um, and I think now might be the time to think what is important to policy. Um, and I particularly grabbed the bit out of the Treasury's Green Book that says... Subjective well-being is not sufficiently robust yet to be used in social cost-benefit analysis. Um, so what does it look like to have something that is sufficiently robust to do that? So there doesn't seem to be very much that's very specific in the policies yet about well-being. And you mentioned the, the triple bottom line, but how would you do the evaluation against well-being in, in that side of the bottom line, in the triple bottom line? So I think this is a time to step back and ask, are we missing some things that we need for the policy angle rather than just what's important to people? Uh, and uh, I've got absolute scales um, an evaluation framework uh, how we actually take all of these bits and put them together um, so that we can uh, make decisions on what to do uh, in, w in one particular measure which might affect another measure in a bad way um, just going on to my last slide so we have this composite indicator challenge where we need to put together I would like us to put together a headline measure because that's really important for visibility I would like my headline measure without GDP in it because I think if you've got the same information in both measures then it's much harder to interpret what's going on but um, you can argue with me about that it's a question for you um, there are plenty of challenges in putting a composite indicator together uh, and David mentioned those and I'm not going to talk about them because he's much more expert than me in that um, but we have these targets and trade-offs so um, do I want a central measure let's assume just for a moment that I can magically um, construct uh, a, a measure of well-being which goes up like GDP goes up without bound um, then would I like my measure to go up on average across the country or would I like the inequality in the measure to be less um, and can I have both of those things at once or can I not do I have to trade one off against another and I think it's very likely that uh, across all those 41 measures we'll have to trade some off in, uh, against another you can make progress in one thing if you accept deterioration in something else um, and we need a framework for doing that. And I think perhaps that that one headline indicator might give us the framework to start that off. Um, you didn't mention uh, in the talk current and future well-being. And that's all combined together in, um, in what ONS is measuring. They explicitly say that it includes both pieces. But I think current is very much about monitoring what's going on and future is about where you have targets. So those might be different. Um, we don't currently have good levers for policy either. So if I decide I want well-being to be better, 
Um, what do I do? Do I, I can't go and raise interest rates or lower interest rates or raise the, um, the retirement age or lower it or do something. So in economics, you get decisions based on econometric models. We don't yet have uh, a model which puts together all of the factors and influences on well-being. And if we did try to do that, we'd get into all the trouble about having relative scales, attenuation of parameters. So I think actually it might be really hard to build a model that's like that. Uh, and because we have this point where there are statistics um, leading, uh, and it's rather driven by the measures, uh, I see a real risk that we may get some perverse incentives um, where um, people try to affect the statistic rather than trying to affect the outcome because it's the statistic we've got. I wanted to challenge Paul and David to say a little bit more um, what the policy targets should be, and I thought it was unfair for me to ask them to do that without at least having a go myself. Um, so I was after more equality on the well-being scale, um, perhaps on an absolute scale rather than a, a relative one, uh, and I think that sustainability is probably more important than current measures. Um, so that's my um, two pennies worth. Uh, and then. Just at the end, uh, I wanted to go back to the title, so New Statistics for Old. I think that was Aladdin, wasn't it? So uh, in, in Aladdin, the evil sorcerer comes along and takes away the old lamp with the genie in it and replaces it with a, a substantially worthless new lamp. Um, is that what's going on here? Well, I rather hope not. I, I hope we haven't lost the old one and that GDP isn't getting chucked out. And I rather hope that the new lamp has more than basic functionality. I don't think it's just going to, to shed some light. I think it's going to do some things. Um, so rather, I think the well-being genie is out of the lamp, uh, and now is the time to make the best use of our three wishes. So what would you like to wish for? And with that, I'm very uh, happy to uh, propose the vote of thanks. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, first of all, I'm Abby Self, and I'm currently the Acting Director for the, the Wellbeing, Inequality, Sustainability and Environment Division at the ONS, which is responsible for the work on well-being. And I'm delighted to be here on behalf of ONS um, to second the vote of thanks for this paper. And I'd particularly like to thank the authors for reminding us that well-being is about national and not just personal well-being, and for keeping alive the single index debate. And these are the main areas I want to focus on today. And I also want to spend just a short time at the end just highlighting some of the wider work on well-being and asking the question, what's in, what's out? And particularly if we're thinking about a single index, I think it's important to consider um, the, the wider areas of well-being that we look at beyond the domains and measures that we've covered. So turning first to personal um, versus national well-being, trying to convey that um, national well-being is more than these ONS4 is a challenge. Um, it always has been. It's, um, but I think it's fair to say that good progress has been made. The paper points out um, that perhaps well-being is more about measurement than it is about take-up. And I think it's whilst it's fair to say that there is more push from the likes of ONS, Cabinet Office and others to, to get the measures taken up, than there is pull from policy examples. I think perhaps being a little bit harsh in some cases. So I'm going to include just a few examples just to demonstrate where there has been take-up, um, acknowledging that there's more work to do. So for turning first to the um, personal well-being measures, the ONS4, as we like to call them, so the four measures that we've spoken about um, that are in the paper and we've spoken about already, are already used in over 20 different government surveys covering a broad range of subjects from housing to health to crime, sport and culture. And then in individual departments, these are just a few examples. So we've got business innovation and skills have used the ONS4 to look at workplace well-being and its connections with business performance. DWP used the ONS4 to evaluate the impact of different interventions on moving people back to work. And the National Citizenship Service, which is a social action programme for 16 to 18 year olds, in its pilot study used the ONS4 to demonstrate whether there was a measurable impact on wellbeing from taking part and found that it did. And now that's been rolled out nationally. But it's not just in the personal wellbeing area. I did want to say a little bit about the, the take up of the wider measures. Um, and particularly in the domains. So there are 10 domains of wellbeing, um, and the Department for Transport use these domains in a tool to help its policymakers assess um, the effect on uh, wellbeing for major transport uh, decisions. The UK Airports Commission use the 10 domains of wellbeing for its quality of life assessment for the implications of the additional runway. And the Cabinet Office have developed a training course 
to help policymakers assess well-being across impacts um, across the ten domains, and this was developed jointly in association with the Social Impacts Task Force, of which ONS are a member. And there's examples outside government too. I don't want to dwell on it too much, but housing developer Barclay Homes used the ten domains because it wanted to build um, buildings of help, wanted to build, steer its building of high-quality places where people choose to live, work, and spend their time. So there are examples out there but I don't d dispute that there is a need to maintain momentum and there is more work to do. And we continue to work closely with the Social Impacts Task Force and the What Work Centre for Wellbeing. What I do think is an opportunity is the sustainable um, development goals, which the paper mentions. The aims of the sustainable development goals, um, or the, the, the SDGs, are designed to guide policy and funding to bring about global progress. And there are 17 goals on health, education, the environment, the economy. I'm not expecting you to be able to read it, but these are the colourful boxes that many of you might have seen um, around the SDGs. ONS has responsible for the national reporting of progress against the SDGs, and I think this is a real opportunity to draw attention to these wider measures of wellbeing and these wider measures of progress um, and, and enable us to, to revisit that and, and strengthen that. Um, and this SDG sort of bridges to the second area that I want to focus on, which is this topic of the single index. I don't think anybody can dispute that it's easier to communicate with impact if you've got one number or a small set of number numbers. But the challenge remains for the ONS as to which ones are the most important. If you include all of the measures in the wellbeing wheel, all 41, do you weight them? Do you give them equal weight? We've always said that, that those choices about weights are up to the individual and, and they should be left that way. And also there's a question of if you leave some out, which ones don't you include? And, and particularly, ONS have been commended for the national debate time and time again about how we went and asked people about um, what mattered. And actually, when we did a follow-up consultation asking, OK, if we needed to whittle down the number of measures we've got, which ones should we leave out? The overwhelming response was you should measure what matters. You shouldn't be concentrating on getting a small number and it doesn't, shouldn't matter how many you have. Now, there are practicalities around that, but I think the message was clear. They'd rather be able to see what's being measured than whittle it down to a, to a neat measure for communication. I said the SDGs provided a nice bridge. The SDGs have 17 goals. They actually started out with the intention of having no more than 10, but it was decided through the various expert groups um, who developed the goals for SDGs, that actually those, there were 17 areas and they couldn't get it down any smaller, and that each of those 17 goals has equal weight. One approach that the ONS are looking at are tackling this issue, the communication issue, through the measures of change, where we're trying to embody the strengths of a single index. For those of you who might be familiar with our wellbeing wheel, I'm not expecting you to read all of that, but at the top you've got the wheel and the tiny white writing of the spokes, if you like, of the individual measures of wellbeing. And in the middle you can see the ten domains which are colour-coded. Round the edge, each measure has been given um, an assessment of change according to red, amber, green status. So the red means that they're deteriorating, the green means they're improving, and then there's a little change and not assessed. Down at the bottom we've got two time periods and here what we try to do is aggregate up the numbers so we can say how many have improved, how many are in each category with the idea being that we can give a single message that says overall according to these measures national well-being is improving and this is something that we report on every six months when we publish the wheel and annually where we publish a life in the UK report and these messages are picked up by journalists, they are picked up by the media in, in terms of how we report them. There's certainly more to do on comms um, in this area, but we believe this is perhaps a better solution than to replicate the weaknesses of the GDP, because wellbeing has largely come about because GDP doesn't measure everything that we want it to, um, and, and also that it perhaps masks some of the, the, the detail underneath, whereas with this approach you can not only see the overall message, but if you want to see which areas are in need of perhaps intervention, you can see, you can see the, the red areas. Finally, I just wanted to just point out a note about not losing sight of other measures. The, the wellbeing wheel and the 41 measures, those are headline measures, but we've always said that actually wellbeing is much more than even that, and there are some, there's some other measures and other work underneath. Um, the paper also points out that there's no definition of wellbeing. ONS definition of wellbeing is how we're doing as individuals, as communities, and as a nation, and also how sustainable this is for the future. I accept it's quite a broad terminology, it's been adopted by the Wellbeing What Work Centre. 
But what we need to look at are these other areas which are part of the work on national wellbeing. Um, so just, just to briefly go around the wheel, at the top we've got um, social capital. This is really drawing on the fact that relationships have been found to be one of the um, most influential aspects to personal well-being. This is about the relationships we have with our neighbours and it's the trust and our, our um, friendships and we're doing work with the OECD to develop standard measures of trust. We've also got work on children's well-being. Um, we're working with the Children's Society and also Department for Education about how we can use these more to, um, at least for DfE, look at more than just educational attainment as an outcome and look at sort of mental well-being as well. We've got down at the bottom in the economic domain, we look at um, household satellite accounts where we value volunteering um, and adult care and childcare. Um, economic wellbeing, these are another set of measures and these are actually released alongside the quarterly national accounts and these are 10 measures where we look at the economy from a household and individual perspective. So it's things like rather than just GDP, it's GDP per capita and it's things like household income. And this is another area, and these are actually cited as a key source in determination of living standards in the UK election campaign. And then moving back around to the top left in our environment and sustainability areas, we've got human capital and also natural capital, um, which was being cited as indispensable and exceptional and enable government ministers to highlight the importance of natural capital to economy and well-being. And also we commissioned to run a low carbon and renewable energy survey to essentially develop a baseline of where we're at in the country um, with businesses that are, that are engaged in low carbon activities. So I think my point really here is, does it have to be bad as well-being to be improving well-being? I think as much as it would be good to communicate how we are doing, I think we've, that also risks losing sight of all the good work that we are doing, which is um, improving well-being. Um, and we need to be really careful as to what's in and what's out um, to avoid the problems with GDP. So I'm being asked to wind up, which is my last slide. I think the ongoing challenge, and it's being touched on, um, is who has ownership of this overall picture. ONS are responsible for measurement and monitoring, but we don't have the power to implement. We have, Paul mentioned earlier, that we, we need to do, um, or we do have a strong role in engagement with policy departments, and we do this through... Um, direct engagement for some of the examples I've mentioned and also um, through the likes of the Social Impact Task Force. But apart from the Cabinet Office who work very hard in this area, nobody has ownership of this overall national wellbeing problem. So in some ways it's not a surprise that individual departments focus on their own areas and it's links to personal wellbeing. Um, I've already said we continue to work with our various partners. Um, I do think the SDGs give us a, a, a great opportunity to bring this emphasis back to the, the wider measures and that work um, exists in the same division as well-being and finally um, in seconding the vote of thanks we welcome papers like this it keeps the issues alive and it reminds us that there is more to be done and well-being is still important thank you michael thank you so much paul and david for um your paper and presentation a really comprehensive account of activity on this whole agenda and as someone who's been an active participant in what you call the second wave of Beyond GDP, it's great to have an opportunity to stand back and acknowledge the really significant progress that, that's been made. Um, and thank you also for your very generous acknowledgement of our role at the New Economics Foundation. It's been a great pleasure sharing our thinking with you, Paul, over the years, both when you were driving these changes at the ONS and since then. Um, I'm going to briefly comment on three aspects of the paper. Um, the methodological challenges of measuring subjective well-being, national well-being as a concept, and the lack of progress in well-being policy. So first on methodological challenges. Um, the paper, and um, David has picked this up, raises the, the uh, homeostatic effect as a particular potential problem um, when we're measuring people's subjective well-being, their, their experiences of life, because people have a, a set base rate to which they return. And this does play a role, um, especially when we're measuring change in well-being over the short term. Um, but I just wanted to make sure we weren't forgetting the wealth of evidence in, in the social, scientific and economic literature um, on which has established key societal conditions which do act as drivers of change in well-being um, at national level and, and in individuals. At national level, particularly strong evidence around unemployment, around social capital and the quality of governance. Um, subjective well-being measurement 
is, you know, robust and has been triangulated with all sorts of other measures, and it does change at a national level in response to these factors. And, if, of course, this sensitivity to other policy factors of interest is exactly why we're so interested in subjective well-being um, measurement. Um, that's what makes it useful. It's not, as it's sometimes caricatured, um, not, I hasten to add, in this paper, but, you know, the, the caricature of a free-floating, fluffy, nice but not essential to know is exactly not what it is. It, it, it's deeply rooted in, in factors of importance. Another methodological issue, just to glance on, which we at NEF have been exploring recently, concerns the issue of distribution, which you rightly say is, is essential in a picture of national well-being, and which um, we, I'd agree with Paul Smith is, is really important as applied to subjective well-being in particular. Um, we've been thinking about the bounded nature of, of subjective well-being measurement and what this means for those of us who are interested in looking at changes in the distribution, because you potentially get a bunching at the top of the measure which distorts measurement of change in the distribution of, of these subjective measures, and, and that's something that we think is, is worthy of um, much more attention and, and further study. Um, so second, moving on to uh, my comment about uh, the importance you place on national well-being as a concept, um, I mean, I absolutely acknowledge the, the really important work that ONS has done using this work, and it's, it's, as I say, really driven forward the agenda on going beyond GDP, which I think um, is now generally acknowledged to be far too narrow a measure to, to assess how, how a society is doing overall. But I share the concern you mentioned in the paper about overloading the concept particularly because I think we've got some evidence now that the framing has been difficult to communicate, and I think not least because of a confusion between um, personal well-being, uh, as based on subjective measurement, and the wider concept of, of national well-being. And then this brings me on to my third point, to what you point out is a disappointing lack of progress in well-being policy, notwithstanding the uh, examples that Abby mentioned, and, and you know we should be celebrating this, including the work of the What Works Centre, in which we're involved, but I think I've heard from many of the key advocates in this agenda that well-being is still really at the margins, as you say, of, of policy decision-making. And for me, a clear, clear reason for this is the lack of an accountability loop from sustained public and media interest in the agenda through to pressure on politicians and therefore through to policy action. Now, you suggest that a single number um, which can stand up to GDP might be the answer. Um, but as you acknowledge, because of the necessarily big, massive research decisions involved in making that decision, it's hard to get acceptance for that in the short term. So I just wanted to share the approach that we've been working on at NEF as an alternative, which is to identify a very small dashboard of five headline indicators. Um, one, each indicator is a single measure, but representing a much wider domain to act as indicators of national success. We chose five because that's what the psychology research says is the amount of information we can hold in our heads. I'm being asked to wrap up, so I will just show you very quickly that based on research on what the UK public has said they want the economy to deliver, our measures are measure good jobs, well-being, environment, fairness and health, and they all draw, draw on official and, and ONS data. They've been gaining more and more traction. Most recently, the Welsh Government has adopted essentially uh, an indicator modelled on our indicator of good jobs under their Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And we think an approach like this might well help the SDG agenda, of which we've heard, gain traction in terms of domestic policy implementation. So really welcome further discussion on whether an approach like this might have a role to play in this agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, if I could add my thanks to... to um Paul and David and, and to the people who contributed to the discussion so far. Um, my comments are in a personal capacity, but they do draw on my experience um, a career in, in government statistics and also economics, actually, so I'm going to make some reference to that. They cover three areas. Um, the proper place of this work in the study of statistics, as I see it, the implications for economics, particularly the measurement of GDP, and the potential impact on policy, which was highlighted in the paper. I thought it was fascinating that the paper goes right back to Sir John Sinclair's statistical account of Scotland. And I think more generally it's refreshing that this goes back to the original field of study of statistics, in fact the etymology of the word even, as the analysis of data about the condition of a, of a state. The paper mentions the assertion by Robert Kennedy that GNP measures everything in short except that which makes life worthwhile, in other words what, measure, what measures matters. And there are other quotes in, in a similar vein, so not everything that can be counted counts. Um, 
or one which was attributed to Galileo, um, that we should measure what is measurable and make measurable what is not so. This presents, as has been noted in the paper, great challenges for statistics, but I think it tries to meet them and the, um, pro the ONS program has met them in very innovative ways through the public debate that's been mentioned, but also through the innovative tools for, for um, interactively displaying the results. And I think this is a commendable example of citizen involvement, which uh, Sir John and other founding members of the RSS would be proud. So that's statistics, and the, the paper, understandably, in the journal and to this audience, concentrates on the statistics, but I wanted to say a couple of things about economics. Um, and particularly, um, the comparison of, and the word competition has been used with GDP. GDP, as has been noted, has a sort of preeminent position in economics to the extent that if you ask a lot of people what an economist is, it will be someone who pontificates about what the latest GDP number is on the, on the TV. If, and if nothing else, I think the existence of this, of an alternative measure of social progress as, be, as is being proposed here, highlights, does highlight some of the deficiencies of GDP. And it also, I think, reminds us that GDP is a relatively recent invention, actually. And also, as was pointed out by David, um, it's an example of pragmatic measurement in, in the same way as, as, as well-being is. And there's a quote from uh, Diane Coyle, who's an economist who's written a recent book called GDP, A Brief but, but Affectionate History. Um, there is no such entity out there in the real world waiting to be measured by economists. It is an abstract idea. And I'll return to this in a moment when I get onto policy impact. So that's sort of macroeconomics. The Although it wasn't the focus of this paper, it, it was alluded to, and I think that well-being, and in particular subjective well-being, has important implications for microeconomics as well, in particular by providing another way, an alternative way, of measuring and valuing non-market goods. Um, and my own department, my own organisation, the Health and Safety Executive, is doing some preliminary work looking at assessing the impact of injuries and ill health, workplace injuries and ill health, using this approach. Finally, on policy impact, and the paper rightly asks, great idea, but what's the use? Um, and I wanted to make a couple of points on the use of well-being measures in policy making. One of them is a, a slightly partisan quibble from the perspective of the Health and Safety Executive, and in fact also Department of Employment, where I used to work with Paul many years ago, and that is that work, um, as a field only features, I think, in one of the 41 indicators. There's a, there's a question about, um, or an indicator about whether people are satisfied with their job. And that, I'm, I would say this, wouldn't I, but that is perhaps undervaluing it, given that uh, it's an activity, work is an activity that most adults, or a lot of adults, spend a lot of their time doing. Um, a more general point, relates back to the point about GDP and beyond. So measuring it well-being doesn't mean we should stop measuring GDP. Nonetheless, as it has been pointed out, in some respects they are in competition, um, in status if not in resources. And in this respect, GDP has the major advantage that it is or, or seems to be one central number. So the, the is issue of um, whether we should have a single a indicator has been touched on. I, I'm falling down on the single, in, single indicator or summary measure side, not because I don't think there are a variety of measures, I think we can do both actually, but really, again to quote the paper, without a single national well-being number, the hegemony of GDP will never be successfully challenged. My final remark relates to the title of the paper, New Statistics for Old, with a question mark, but I think that in a sense measurement of well-being can be seen to a, as a return to, to old values um, in respect of both statistics and economics. And I think in, the, in that sense, it's to be welcomed. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to comment uh, on this paper. These are my personal views. Um, I should declare an interest, which is that I'm an economist. So, um, as you can imagine, uh, I found this a very good read, but um, there were lots of things for, as an economist for me to disagree with. So I had four points and then a proposal. Uh, point number one is just to reiterate, and this is beautifully dealt with in the paper, economists are just basically quite uneasy about this stuff. 
because we just think GDP is a miraculous invention. The economy consists of iPads and cheese sandwiches. How on earth are we going to add those two things up? And the answer is, we add them up by prices. And that's what's brilliant about GDP. So I just like all that stuff. We don't know what to do when it come, if an economy consists of iPads, cheese sandwiches, and happiness. We don't know how to add that up. We don't know, as you mentioned earlier on, whether we should do it instead of the iPads and the cheese sandwiches. We just don't know what to do. So there's a wonderful review of that in the paper, which I liked. But I just think we have to confront that issue um, uh, full on. That's point number one. Point number two, I have to say that I am uneasy about the statistical office collecting attitudinal data, which I regard happiness as being part of. I just don't know where that would stop. Should we, should we, as a, should we tell the Statistical Bureau to collect attitudinal data? I don't know, people's attitude to politics, what they want to vote, how they feel about immigrants, how they feel about Brexit, all that kind of stuff. Maybe we should collect attitudinal data for firms. What are firms' investment intentions? That seems to be a perfectly reasonable thing to ask firms, and lots of companies, lots of people like the CBI do all of that. But I'm uncomfortable about attitudinal data. I think it relates to the adding up problem. Third point I want to make, I'm very worried about survey fatigue. It just is the case that it's really hard to get people to reply to the surveys that the Office of National Statistics sends out, indeed any stats bureau sends out. And I'm nervous, therefore. I like experimental statistics, that's fine, but I'm nervous if we load up the population with too, much, um, too, too many questions, uh, we will crowd out the other types of questions that we want them to answer. Uh, fourth and final point, uh, I'm also worried about organisational fatigue as well. It's great to ask the Office of National Statistics to do lots of things, but do you know what? They've got to measure financial services a hell, a hell of a lot better. And I just feel, and this is my prejudice as an economist, we need to get that done first you know, before we do this other stuff. Therefore, that's the end of my points. Therefore, if I may, just one quick proposal. My proposal is we just designate this as being experimental and we contract it out. That is to say we ask a research organisation or something like that to do this kind of thing. It can sit in parallel with the ONS work on GDP. We leave the ONS to concentrate on GDP and compelling firms and using administrative data to answer all of that sort of stuff. And then this stuff can sit in dashboard type of style. People can make up their own weights and all that kind of thing. So as a way of organisation, I, 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 I'm happy to support this, but I think it could be uh, more effectively contracted out outside the official ONS. But again, thank you very much for the paper, which I enjoyed reading and found very uh, um, informative and thought-provoking. Um, I'm actually here representing the um, statistician at the EHRC. I'm actually a lowly social researcher, um, but I would also like to thank Paul and David for the paper. Um, I also have personal interest in well-being. It's part of my past research, and so I find it incredibly interesting. I'm going to briefly comment on three aspects of the paper, with a po kind of policy focus on that, and to kind of have a bit of a discussion about where the Commission's work might be relevant or interesting. So, first of all, we recognise that there are a number of factors that influence a person's personal well-being. Um, as identified by Beaumont. Um, the EHRC, to give you a bit of a background uh, for those who don't know, um, the Commission maintains a set of measurement frameworks that it uses to assess progress towards equality and human rights in Great Britain. Um, the areas of day-to-day -day life that these frameworks cover, and which were most recent, recently assessed in the Commission's Is Britain Fairer Review on Equality and Human Rights that we submitted to Parliament, show some overlap with those, sorts, with those factors that are identified in the paper that you've written as affecting well-being. These include um, our health, where we live, um, our education, our relationships, and how much we earn and where we work. Our assessment that we made of where things are getting better or worse or staying the same, and the equalities within that, so who's doing better or worse, perhaps could inform or be interesting to, to see how that could inform what impact inequalities might be having on well-being, if those are factors that influence them. And the second point I'll make quickly um, is that we also recognise the challenge in recognising country differences or taking into account country differences whilst maintaining the comparability of measures between countries. Um, a, a challenge that we found when we were bringing together the, the Is Britain Fairer review was being able to confidently compare England and Wales with Scotland. Um, and compare evidence on equality and human rights within the measurement framework for those countries. Now, while a common measurement framework um, helps to might help provide comparable evidence, so a, a common framework such as that proposed in the paper, 
common GB framework of well-being. Um, we found that yes, it must be balanced, uh, a common framework has to be balanced with recognition that each country will have their own pressing issues, as we found in the Is Britain Fair review, as well as their own cultural context, which will influence, or must influence, the shape of well-being. Uh, my third point will kind of be in the form of a sort of question. Um, that is, well, my question is uh, around the use, um, the focus on equalities in well-being. So the focus on the ONS well-being measure, as I understand it, has largely been on obtaining a, a sort of national level of well-being. Although we do understand there's been some, some work by ONS to assess gender differences in well-being, as well as interest from the OECD to look at kind of developing group-specific well-being measures, or indicators rather. So the EHRC measurement framework focuses on what the different, uh, differing experiences are of people with protected characteristics, uh, such as those set out, uh, well, which are those set out under the Equality Act. That's not just um, gender, but also age, race, disability, religion or belief, sexual orientation, and gender reassignment, as well as pregnancy and maternity and marriage and civil partnership. There are lots of factors against which you can look at the inequalities uh, and whether some people are doing better in well-being than others. Um, my question, well, this equality element gave, gains particular relevance in light of, as we've mentioned today, the UN's Agenda on Sustainable Development Goals, it was set in September, um, where the goal of good health and well-being sat alongside that of reducing inequalities. So I suppose my question is, um, should more work be done to assess inequalities in well-being, not just on gender, but across all the protected characteristics you recognise under the Equality Act in this country? And should this form future work for ONS or the other bodies that have been identified as doing work in this area? Thank you. Now I want to just deal with a few aspects which I see as a uh, tremendous scope and potential. And that will come from ancillary and other sources of data, big data, the context that we're living in, and the ability then to handle that. And I will be especially pointing towards the work of uh, sociologist uh, Pierre Bourdieu and, uh, and uh, with him accompanying him, uh, Jean-Paul Benzikri, in regards to the uh, mechanisms and approaches uh, for handling such uh, such such scope. Here we have, for instance, um, just a little, nice little quote, which was a personal comment uh, by uh, Ben a while back, just indicating analysis, nothing data is everything, but is data to go into baskets or to bins? In any case, I'd like to draw reference to this other red paper uh, uh, some a short while back, last August, if memory serves me well here, in regard to uh, this uh, pa paper entitled Perils and Potentials of Self-Selected Entry to Epidemiological Studies and Surveys. And basically this was pointing to the absolute requirement that self-selection and anything to do with social media and the like is inherently biased and therefore the context however, of big data will offer potential for calibration and therefore that is uh, important, uh, yet at the same time, of course, implying lots of very interesting statistical uh, uh, challenges. Clearly, that, that's the case. This, con this uh, quotation continues here uh, just in terms of this whole uh, aspect of selection. So a bridge is needed between data analytics, technology, and deployment of outcomes. That was a focal aspect of that particular paper. And that can be provided by the geometry and topology of data and of information. And therefore, that is really my... Um, uh, basic point being made here. So just in regards to what I view as very important from the point of view of well-being, well, to my mind, mortality and such like is a very important aspect. So too is the whole role of qualitative aspects as well as quantitative. And uh, just in regard to this, this first uh, 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 paper I just saw uh, recently, it's nothing to do with, the, uh, with, uh, the, uh, with Thursday of next week <laughs> and voting and so on, uh, just uh, indicates here a quotation from this paper, there are wide-ranging social, economic and political implications from the polarisation of health and voting in Britain. And it just deals with certain aspects of this, which I think is just, just interesting in its own right. But maybe going on to the second point here, I was just having a look uh, 
uh, just the other day at, uh, at Human Mortality Database and the availability of data in a comparative sense globally and therefore its role potentially in uh, an area related to well-being. And finally, I'll just mention one area of work with a colleague, uh, uh, Boris Merkin, formerly of Birkbeck, now uh, uh, an economics uh, univer uh, oriented university in Moscow, uh, on uh, the whole role of research impact, both qualitative and quantitative. And uh, this paper is just nearing completion, where we are using the ontology as fundamentally important to characterize an area and then to look for changes in that ontology to look for stratification and not ranking. I mean, stratification, after all, is what's used in the research evaluation framework, as we all know, but nonetheless, that is perhaps of greater importance in practice. And we're looking at that with regard to editorial roles and my own role in the not-too-distant past in terms of being a director in a national funding agency. So just in terms of uh, one other point, ethics of big data, it was already raised by one of the speakers about the fact of the individual, uh, the individuality in the context of uh, single measures of, of such things. And uh, therefore, the rehabilitation of individuals is called for. And that, that's a quotation from this book by uh, Brigitte Leroux and uh, Frédéric Le Baron, again dealing with the Bourdieu approach uh, which is uh, at issue. Uh, I think it was um, uh, one speaker who mentioned the role of social, human and natural capital. Very, very relevant, therefore, in the context of what I'm just dealing with. So uh, the big data inputs are required to calibrate and validate. Open data sources are very give rise to very great potential. One area which I'm beginning to look into at the moment is this adult psychiatric morbidity data with a colleague who is a practicing psychiatrist. And I think that could be quite, quite useful as well in this whole area. So just in regards then to Bourdieu's analytics, uh, uh, from the quotation from the reference as shown, amount to the global, hence big data, effects of a complex structure of interrelationships which is not reducible to the combination of the multiple effects of independent variables. So therefore we must really look for homologies, therefore uh, uh, topological characteristics which are shared between different areas and which relate uh, potentially relate then the different areas and causality can be a follow-up uh, to trend analysis and the like. And my final slide, just an approach therefore to drawing uh, uh, benefit from uh, these uh, potential uh, other aspects of sourcing data from uh, the uh, increasingly availability, uh, available uh, sources, but also with the requirement that, uh, that such data be provided as open data and that we all have the right to uh, see the sources and to, in to investigate ourselves if we, if we wish or study further the sources of the, uh, the, d the data which will go into uh, single measures. And therefore, how can that be done the, the bottom line is geometric and topological data analytics with tremendous potential for addressing the very, very wide field, which I see. And again, my, I'm grateful for speakers and for uh, uh, especially the, 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 the presentation today for opening up this area and for basically giving us a focal point to be uh, uh, strategically oriented towards what is uh, raised in uh, today. Thank you very much. Um, the best red papers, which this is one, always raise many more questions than they answer, and hopefully I'm going to raise some even more questions uh, for you. Um, speaking as a human and speaking from the heart and speaking to many other humans, including friends and family, I really like the idea of measures of well-being. I mean, who wouldn't, right? How do you feel? Uh, do you feel great this week? Um, so I'm delighted to be asked about uh, my well-being, and I hope the ONS will be around soon to ask me that. Um, however, the professional statistician in me uh, finds the concept extremely challenging, as I think you guys have acknowledged in your paper, and I'm also a bit cautious. Um, you, in particular, have carefully outlined some of the difficulties, particularly in Section 6, but even after reading it, I'm not completely convinced that an excellent, unique solution exists to the encapsulation of well-being. Um, the statistics are definitely telling us something, and they, because there are lots of them, they might be an adequate solution to something, but what precisely do they tell us? 
do different indices tell different stories? And even in the discussion already, I think we've had suggestions of very different things that we might um, look at. Um, how would these different indices appear to the public and to the media, especially when one index is telling you one thing and another index may be going in a different direction? After reading about the many different indices, statistics, and statistical interpretations of well-being, I really started to wonder about what exactly are we trying to measure? Is there a universal definition of happiness? Is my well-being the same as your well-being? In contrast, the pound coin in my pocket is the same as your pound coin in your pocket, even though I realize that's a bit different to what GDP actually is. So what is the underlying population quantity of well-being? What can I tell my students uh, in a lecture about what that might be? Does it exist? Is it univariate, even for a single person? Or is it a functional quantity, or what? Can we, as statisticians, create more of a modeling framework for well-being? I'm asking this not just because I like statistical models, but I think it'll help us think about questions such as estimation error of the parameters, the uncertainty in the process of model selection, or if we want to move on to things like investigating correlation structures, for example. I was very excited by your reference to figure three in the ONS uh, 2013 personal well-being in the UK document, and in particular the way that you um, highlighted issues with the claims of statistical significance in that document. Um, it's not clear to me how those measures were computed, derived, and I was really thinking that the underlying variability should be far higher than it actually is, as maybe you alluded to in your paper. Um, and uh, this has been mentioned several times already. The figure also caused me to wonder about comparability of populations. So as someone's already said, um, during the period there were large movements of people across the EU. I mean, do, they have, do these movements have any bearing on the changes in the life satisfaction statistics? Probably for some countries, I think they do. Um, well, maybe the real question, or another question, is what do you actually mean by the UK population at any one time? If we're going to ask them these questions. You can adopt a baseline, like you suggest, but this can become quite outdated quite quickly, especially if there are large changes in populations. It's not clear to me that GDP and the like suffer from the same problems, but maybe GDP is intrinsically an easier thing to define and measure. I'm intrigued by the possibility that well-being measures might be used to define and evaluate policy options, and coming from a time series perspective, could it be useful to forecast well-being in certain scenarios? And once again, do you think we'd need a model to do that? Overall, though, my heart and my head welcome this paper as an important step forwards for both consideration and assessment of well-being and also for their future development and improvement. So thank you very much. I'm going to focus on just two words that uh, Paul used, history and objectives for pragmatic, pragmatic measurement. There's a key bit of history that nobody touched on. I was part of the uh, No Health Without Mental Health Steering Group under the Mental Health Summit. It was an interdepartmental group, and also provided a liaison between that group and the big society group with the cabinet office. And we wrote into the very first meeting in June 2010 of uh, No Health Without Mental Health that we needed national measures of well-being. And it's been very useful to have them. However, there's another aspect of history. Monday, I spent Royal College of Psychiatrists. Psychiatrists don't often talk about prevention and well-being, but that turned out to be the focus of the day. And the focus turned out to be the childhood well-being that I think Juliet raised. Um, or no, sorry, it was Abby who raised. And let's divide the room into two halves. You have had no adverse childhood experiences like neglect, abuse, bereavement, your parents becoming seriously ill. You've had four experiences that were really unpleasant in early childhood. As adults, about eight or nine percent of you will develop common mental illness, and if you experience adversity as adults, like losing your job, no economist, austerity, that was something we talked about a lot, uh, some of you will kill yourselves or become alcoholic, but that's a really rare event on this side of the room, okay? Half of you, as adults, will develop common mental illnesses, and if you experience adversity like losing your job, almost all the suicides and alcoholism, and lots of other nasty things, going to jail, 
will be on this side of the room. Like 90% of the suicides will be over here. So the life, of course, is an important part of well-being and has huge um, predictive effects. And that's the main lesson from the psychiatrist. The early part of your history determines how you respond to adversity. Now, yesterday, I was at the Faculty of Public Health, and they launched Better Mental Health for All, which has several pages on well-being and its measure. And I'd like to emphasize just two aspects. One is resilience and the need to have community measures as well as personal measures. And we always intended that in No Health Without Mental Health because many services operate in between them. Uh, and uh, also in this, I'm sorry, I have to look it up because I only collected it last night. Uh, there is a statement on well-being um, that it, mental and social well-being are inextricably linked in both cause and effect ways. So a social dimension of well-being is vital from the public health point of view. And I'll finish with just one pragmatic example. At yesterday's meeting, we had people discussing the floods in Somerset and York. In Somerset, people couldn't get back into their homes for months. The key aspect of well-being was not individual anxiety, happiness, life satisfaction. Something was happening in communities where some villages recovered much better from the flood, were much more resilient, and others were less resilient. And in fact, in the resilient ones, they used Juliet's five ways to well-being, <coughs> reactively to try and support people who had seen their homes wrecked for months and didn't know when they'd get back in. And different villages in Somerset and in the north of England, in particular, the was striking in Somerset, were very different. We need something that picks up that your neighborhood is vulnerable, and your neighborhood will come through something like a flood okay. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to thank the uh, presenters for a very interesting paper that raises uh, a number of issues. Um, now, measuring the, the state of society using other than purely economic performance measures is clearly an aspiration, commands a lot of support um, in the population. And the present paper is a very welcome addition to the debate and usefully airs many of the problems associated with the measurement process. Uh, there's plenty I'd like to discuss, but I really want to focus on one thing uh, today that I think has not really had much of an outing uh, so far in the discussion. Now, the paper spends some time, um, particularly at the beginning, on the international aspects of measuring well-being, notably the projects that are, have been and are being supported by the OECD, and describes how the UK programme implemented largely through the ONS work, owes much to this earlier work. There's a brief reference to national variation in weightings um, given to different aspects of well-being, but there seems to be little questioning um, of the fundamental assumption, the assumption I think is fundamental, um, that we really can have any kind of comparability across nations. And this was something alluded to by Paul Smith uh, as well. For example, um, OECD has striven in the past, and still does, to construct so-called universal comparable assessments of educational achievement, uh, notably using its PISA survey that many people will be familiar with. But this effort has actually been strongly criticised uh, by many people on the ground that even if you can surmount translational barriers, uh, and these are often very large, the very idea or notion um, that achievement can be measured in the same way across different nations, different educational systems, and different cultures is actually highly debatable. Critics have argued uh, that the attempt to do so in practice, in effect, simply becomes a device to judge all countries according to the perceived cultural desiderata, desiderata of a few largely highly industrialized countries such as the United States and many of the Anglophone, Anglophone cultures. Now, whether or not one accepts such criticisms, I think they are at least worthy 
of a more extended discussion uh, than is either given in this paper or, as far as I can tell, in any of the discussions, uh, the official discussions uh, about measuring uh, well-being. Thus, in the context of measuring well-being, questions about, for example, whether people feel anxiety are likely to be understood quite differently in different cultures, and indeed in different subcultures, in different parts of the United Kingdom even. And issues such as this, which are fundamental uh, to how you uh, do measurements, seem to be the starting point. And yet it seems to me they've had very little exposure uh, and public discussion or discussion uh, in the research community as such. <coughs> so it's been argued in the case of educational measurement that once the actual measuring ins instruments are developed by national statistics offices or by OECD, whoever, they in fact tend to get promoted and adopted with little modification across the world, despite assurances um, and, and, and views that are expressed in the paper about the need to respect national differences. That's not what happens in practice. So it happens to be my view that the fundamental questions of meaning such as these are actually more important than the detailed measurement properties that are in fact discussed by the authors. And I'd be very interested in the author's uh, response uh, to all of that. Finally, uh, at the end of the paper, in the aptly titled section, What's the Use?, um, the authors turn to how people might use measures of well-being, and other discussants have commented on this. There isn't a very extended discussion uh, in the paper, but it does seem to me to be reasonable to ask a number of further questions. For example, are the results uh, that come out of measures uh, of well-being likely to be cherry-picked by policymakers as they often do in other areas, when findings emerge that they happen to like and, and, and not cherry picked, where they don't like uh, the findings, is there any way to guard against that? How do you do it? Um, it's an important issue. Can one really use such measures to make causal type statements? And much of the discussion seems to have assumed you can make causal type statements, and yet we all know this is extremely difficult. Um, and I'd like to hear the author's views about the limitations um, to making those causal type uh, inferences about policies or programs. And finally, I might ask, will the data be available so that other researchers or other users can analyze them in order to try provide critiques of policy, not just for policymakers to decide what policy to use, but for the rest of us to actually criticize uh, those policies. Um, and finally, I am winding up, the authors claim that measures will be pointless, and I quote, unless governments, businesses, institutions, and individuals actually take the findings on board and use them in making decisions. Therein, however, seems to me, lies the danger. Taking on board face results without caveats about meaning and suitability for causal inference could be quite misleading for potential users. And it seems to me one of the roles of bodies such as the RSS might be to point this out, urge caution, and alert potential users to the underlying complexities. Thank you. I'm uh, Tom King from uh, Newcastle University. I was pleased uh, Abby said something about developing uh, measures of well-being for children. But I wanted to offer a, a developmental uh, point of view, but also to start with something about the diagram. You, you remember the sort of circles about the different factors which can make about the individual and then their environment and things like this, and um, offer a, a sort of critique of this, uh, because I implicit there is that this is sort of the same for uh, people, that the boundary of these circles is the same. And I, I wanted to, to go back to some work by somebody called Aaron Antonovsky, who looked at uh, salutogenesis, so very much of... Um, uh, the era of resilience, well-being, and m many other constructs, which was the origins of health. So actually, we should be looking at how most of the time most people are mostly healthy, rather than just focusing on all the uh, pathology. And uh, he established that there was something important here called the sense of coherence, which people had over their lives, which was characterized by um, 
comprehensibility, meaningfulness, and manageability. Uh, and this had a sort of sphere where they were, they were interested, that actually not everybody is worried about famine and war and climate change, and they look more, more locally. And so this issue of whether people are judging their well-being over the same range, I, I, I thought was important. Um, I wanted to, to say, uh, going beyond GDP allows us to look at children in a way that we might sort of not think of them as being in the workforce. Or we might quite narrowly say, well, they're going to be in the workforce. Are they getting, going to get qualifications? And I thought this was quite good uh, to allow us to measure uh, a, wi a wider, uh, the whole population's well-being, rather than just the, the, those who are contributing uh, economically I in one way. Particularly as we think perhaps um, uh, uh, testing children may be causing greater stress than in previous generations. Th this, this is worth uh, tracking uh, the policy. But I did notice that the annual population survey isn't measuring children, and I, I, I wondered, I, I feel this is a problem. Um, you could ask their parents about their children's well-being. This has uh, pros and cons in itself, but I wondered actually if this is uh, something that, that should be worth developing. Uh, but the developmental issue I wanted to say about children is if uh, you, you've seen tiny children, their world is incredibly tiny and actually it grows as they develop. And so if uh, factors that come into their purview uh, affect their well-being negatively or less, well, they have less sort of sense of coherence over them, then you might expect their well-being to reduce as they got older simply because they were becoming more aware of more things. And if different children are developing at different rates, this makes it quite complicated. And I, I thought taking into account this sort of developmental idea was really worth um, thinking about. Um, I, uh, I, I think um, uh, the, the, the well-being of, uh, of children is something that would be quite uh, difficult to understand in the first place, but to, there, there's too much. There, there's a lot of focus on the cognitive development of children, and actually, the socio-emotional development is often uh, neglected. And things like well-being are something that I think the OECD has been looking at specifically in children as well. So I, I think there is something there, and there is a recognition that there's something else uh, that that we need to to, to look ab look at. Um, and uh, there are the the idea that you could have an age um, invariant measure of well-being in children, I, I think, isn't sensible. But actually, the developmental well-being of children is something we should be looking to understand, uh, not just say it's rather difficult. Um, so I, I would I, I look forward to what what you're planning to do about well-being in children. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great RSS tradition to have the time to reflect on these points and reflect and, and, and write something. And that's, I'm sure, will be the only way that we can do justice to, to, to the richness of the, the points you've raised. When Paul Smith introduced us to Sinclair's Beatles early on, I thought this is going to be an interesting uh, discussion. And, and, and so it proves. So thank you, everybody, who, who, who contributed. And um, there's no way that we can kind of reflect on, on all of that, and I'm afraid, and, and uh, respond to the points. Uh, here and now, but we will do so very, very fully in, in, uh, in, in, in b before this gets written up in the, in, in, in the journal. I was just keeping tally of the people who kind of, how many people came out in terms of a single measure or, or not. I mean, Paul Smith thought we should have a headline measure, PS, but without GDP, so his GDP will still be there as another headline measure. So is that two or is that one? I wasn't quite sure about that. Abby said no, not not, uh, uh, not not for the measures, but looking innovatively at ways of uh, looking at change, and which is kind of. Uh, Juliet said no, you need you need five, but I do think that five includes GDP either, Juliet, does it? So that's maybe six, or I don't know. Um, now Alan came out in terms of a angle. Alan Spence came out in terms of a, a single measure, but Guy came up and said probably not. So you know, I think just as a little microcosm of uh, how interesting and how complex this this conversation is will continue to be I think that, 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 that that's a great one um, the points that were made uh, all of them I say will re re reflect on the points that were made about the international or the cross-national comparisons I think 
did, did deserve more space and we're able to give them in our, in our paper and we'll see if we can put something in uh, the response to that or maybe there's maybe another paper to be written there so thanks, uh, thanks for that. You see I can be, become an academic in the last, uh, last, last few years. Um, uh, I'm sure David might want to uh, make one or two other, other, uh, uh, other points as well. Um, I think that probably gives a flavour that there's lots here we need to take away and reflect on. So thank you from my point of view from both of us. Thank you very much for uh, all your contributions. So how long have we got? <laughs> um, I'd like to thank you all for, uh, for wonderful and, and thought-provoking discussion. Like Paul, I'm not going to try now to answer the particular questions that will merit some careful thought. I'd just like to make one comment. Um, several people remarked on the particular merit of, of GDP that it's based on the common numeraire of the pound. It transforms everything to this common unit, which can be added up or combined in however you want to do it, Where, whereas aspects of well-being, the sort of things we've been talking about, can't be so mapped. But I think that's really the point. GDP, based on the pound, misses vitally important aspects. And that's indeed why this whole exercise is of measuring well-being is so important. There's this old adage, which I'm, <coughs> I'm sure all of you are familiar with, that what's get, what gets measured gets done. And that's why measuring well-being is so critically important. Thank you very much.